I'm Dan Lowther. I head up fintech at a B2B uh, technology PR agency uh, called CC Group. Um, and today I'm going to be looking at the best and the worst of fintech PR in 2019. Feels like a sort of end of first day session, doesn't it really? Um, but before I get into the, the fun stuff, um, I kind of wanted to lay a little bit out around the landscape which is driving some of these epic wins and fails. Um, I want to talk about the age of fintech giants. So, um, you all probably recognize this advert which appeared on our screens in the summer. And uh, that is the Monzo TV advert. And this is the point where I thought fintech has really gone mainstream, hasn't it? I think at the same time my dad was asking me about whether he should use TransferWise or Revolut to send money abroad. So again, I thought, yeah, it's probably gone mainstream now when your dad's asking you about it. Um, and aside from the sort of cacophony of card products on the tube, um, you know, the impression that I'm getting is that fintechs old and new are now really investing in marketing. Um, but why are companies taking a more risky approach to public relations? Um, why is fintech become sort of part of our common consciousness? Um, why is fintech now mainstream? And um, I believe there are three reasons for this. The first one, congestion, right? So more companies getting more money from more VC and PE houses. Um, and if you can look here, uh, there are more fintechs being born today than there, are, than there have been for many years. Uh, and this means that if you take any part of the industry, business lending, mortgage lending, retail investing, for example, you're not looking at, from five years ago, a couple of players in that space. You're looking at five, six, ten different players. So all of a sudden, fintech's gone from, hi, I just need to raise awareness of what I'm doing and why it's different to your bank, to all of a sudden I need to differentiate from all the other guys because we're all doing similar things. What else has happened? Um, the growth in fintech numbers and maturation is driving consolidation. So this graph is quite interesting. In June, the deal volume in 2019 had already outstripped the last four years. The market is consolidating at a rapid rate. There is a lot of M&A activity. What does that mean? Bigger players, bigger ambitions, bigger budgets, bigger campaigns. Finally, my third C, consumer. More fintech companies are now consumer facing and are marketing to millions of SMEs and consumers that there are out there. Fintech is less of a B2B behind the scenes play. What that means is that you have got some big players that are targeting lots of consumers and SMEs with mainstream PR and marketing tactics. So these three different elements together means that we have entered the age of fintech giants. Um, you'll all recognize a lot of these logos. Um, word of mouth and social sharing simply is not good enough anymore. And that is what a lot of these players have been relying on, right? Um, most fintech companies now accept they need to be more creative, more bold, and at a scale that they've never gone to before. And campaigns are using mainstream media channels, which are more emotive, and in some cases, more divisive. So without any further ado, now we know why we're seeing some of these bigger campaigns and more bold uh, activities from these players. What are the best and worst of uh, the last year? And you know what? This is gonna be an interactive session. So for each one that I put up, I'm gonna ask you whether you think it's an epic win or it's an epic fail. So I just want a show of hands. Klarna, Snoop Dogg. So if you don't know this, in January, Snoop Dogg invested in Klarna and became its brand ambassador. Snoop is now the face of Klarna's consumer campaign focused on smooth payments. Now, do we believe this is a epic win? Raise your hands. Win, epic win, epic win. Cool, few people. Or an epic fail. Oh, more people, it's a failure. So my view, which doesn't count for an awful lot, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, um, is that it's a massive win, massive win. So well done everybody out there who said win, I think anyway. Why is it a win? I have a few reasons. Firstly, Klarna is no longer a B2B brand, it's a B2C brand. It markets with the retailers like Arcadia that it works with. Um, and how do you raise awareness amongst millions of consumers who you want to use your 
buy now, pay later service. Well, get a big brand ambassador like Snoop Dogg who drove 15 million views of your YouTube video within 24 hours of you announcing the news. Um, Snoop Dogg's involvement was covered by the business and the fintech guys, but guess who else covered it? GQ. How on earth would Klarna get into GQ if it didn't work with something like Snoop Dogg? And this was two months after they announced it. That is a long tail of coverage, right? So who they work with is very important. Secondly, where is Klarna focusing its, all, all its efforts at the moment? The US, biggest market for that business. Snoop Dogg's probably a nice fit for the US and other coverage that resulted from this was in Fox News, for example, CNBC. Um, you know, it's a stunt, but it's quite a strategic one. And finally, it's about brand alignment. Snoop Dogg is known to be a cool, smooth dude and all everything they do is about smooth payments. It fits quite well and it takes them away from being some sort of back-end payments company into being something that's more consumer facing. So, in my view anyway, Snoop Dogg is a win. Next one. At one point in January, there was barely a square foot of outdoor media in London which wasn't covered by this sort of poster. Uh, a new fintech called Viola, Viola Black um, launched a campaign which was called Move Over Monzo. So, again, would we think this is a win or a fail? You're all correct. This is probably one of the worst examples of marketing I have actually ever seen. Um, why is it a fail? Well, firstly, what does Viola Black do? I don't know about you. I don't know. All I know is that apparently they're different to Monzo. But do you know what? I've heard of Monzo. So what does that make me think as a consumer? The problem is, is that if you don't explain you're different to your competitor, and then you mention your competitor in the process, all you're doing is raising awareness of your competitor. If this was the broadband market, and you were talking about BT, or you were talking about another well-known provider, or if it was, I don't know, uh, utilities, right? Everybody's aware of different players, and, and you can reference competitors in what you're doing. The market is so nascent. Why make hay for the next guy, right? Um, the really interesting thing about this was, they did this, and then they went quiet for four months. Then after four months, this appeared in the Daily Mail. Now, I don't know about you, I'll give you a chance to read it, they don't sound that positive, do they? Despite comparing itself to the bank popular millennials, it's a prepaid card. Um, so the Daily Mail looked at the proposition and obviously decreed it was maybe not the best. Um, and the problem is that if you're going to go for a stunt or a big bang, at least get your USP across. And if you don't do that, at least follow up on that big wave of awareness and talk about what your proposition is. And they did neither. So unfortunately, this is a, this is a bit of a fail. Onto a, onto a new one. This is products, Peter. These have themes. Well, the first two were stunts. These are products. So Curve announced that its card allows you to shop in the past. I know. Sounds pretty amazing. Um, and one card, the one card to rule them all provider, who's actually been in the news for all the wrong reasons uh, in the last week or so, which I'm not going to get into now, um, claim that you can go back 14 days and change which card you made a payment on. I don't know if everybody's aware of Curve, I'll just explain very quickly. Um, so Curve is a sort of a single card and wallet where you can put all of your cards on. Uh, and then when you come to pay, you can choose which card you place that payment to. So one time you can use the wallet to pay using your Amex card, another time you can use a prepaid card, etc., etc. And this allowed you to, after you'd made a payment, shift which card you'd used. So do we think that this is a epic win? Raise your hands. Epic win, epic win, epic win. Sounds good, or epic fail. It's a win, it's a win, people. Um, why is it a win? Well, it's creative, it's bold. It, how many press releases have you seen talking about a product that is a game changer, that is going to result in a paradigm shift in the industry? Almost never does this happen when people say it. This is a very, very simple offering where the agency or the company, I don't know who did it, have taken a really creative approach that has caught the imagination. This is wide money coverage. There was coverage in Independent, Reuters, Forbes. This got blanket coverage everywhere. What's also great about it is it's not a stunt or something madcap to create the headlines. It is something, it's a concept that's easy to get your head around and is tightly linked to the product that is being offered. Um, and finally, it really fits in with their brand promise. Curve is all about choice. 
giving you the choice to use any card you want, and in, and in this case, um, being able to change the card that you're using after after the uh, after the transaction has taken place. Um, so I thought this was uh, I thought this was pretty cool, pretty big win from what is fundamentally a product announcement. Next one. In April, Halifax rebranded, re including a new app and card, and launched a campaign called Make It Happen. I hope we're all inspired. The rebrand was uh, to help Halifax better compete with digital-only players. Now, was the rebrand a epic win? Oh, yeah, I think we're on the right lines here, people. Or an epic fail? Yes. Um, the rebrand was meant to help Halifax compete with its rivals, um, but something weird happened on the day of the announcement, some social media chatter about um, the card and the app they've mocked up, and there was a tweet from this person you might have heard of. Um, he's the CEO of Monzo, um, and the tweet says, it's great to see your updated brand identity, but it looks like you forgot to update a couple of things. The card in the photo still displays Monzo's BIN number, so that's the payment information associated with Monzo's uh, account. Um, and actually has the name of one of their staff members on there as well. Um, so kind of a bit, kind of missing some detail. Um, so the story stopped being about make it happen uh, and all became about Monzo ripping off, uh, sorry, uh, Halifax Mon ripping off Monzo and also um, Starling due to the teal colored card. So this is the headlines that they didn't want, but the headlines they got. Um, so why this is a fail is because their campaign ended up doing exactly what they didn't want it to do. Um, it made them look like a copycat to the digital tra challenges when they wanted to differentiate. Oh, and the other thing that's interesting as an aside was that mock-up was from a design agency they didn't even employ and was accidentally used as part of the launch by somebody who, yeah, maybe didn't work for them for much longer. Um, Moving on to company launches. In October, Sokin announced its launch with the aim to improve cross-border payments. It would do this by using blockchain technology and charging a subscription fee for cross-border transactions. Sounds pretty disruptive, right? Subscription fees, blockchain, etc. Is this an epic win or a fail of a, of a launch? So, sorry, win, fail. Ah, okay. Um, in my view, you're right. Um, so firstly, their numbers are all wrong. If your USP is one monthly fee for international payments and you're charging people £9.99 and in your press release you say that your service will reduce costs for all users, it doesn't take a genius to work out that that is flatly not true. If you don't spend more than £9.99 on any transaction fees for cross-border, it will be more expensive for you. And that is something that a number of publications, including the Financial Times, pointed out to them. Secondly, there's massive question marks over if you're in a, uh, if you are uh, sending money from a uh, developed economy to a developing economy, um, some of those tariffs simply don't work out if you're, uh, say, a migrant worker. Uh, the second one is, Sokin uses the word the blockchain. And um, the FT asked the CEO of Sokin um, how uh, their blockchain would transfer fiat money given that, the, that uh, fiat money doesn't run on the blockchain. And do you know what the CEO said? I quote, that bit of the press release was wrong. Cool. Um, the last reason why this is a fail is that, needless to say, the press didn't appreciate the business model and the buzzwords. The FT article took the company's task saying it was using distributed Technicolor Dream Ledger, which is like the best phrase I've ever heard, and it's one that's going to stick with me when everybody mentions DLT. Um, so what they did get is this. This is what happens if you Google Sokin. This is the FT article which rips them apart. Anybody who looks for this business, types in an organic search, will now be confronted with an extremely negative article as the fifth search result. So the importance of PR to sales and reputation is put in stark uh, contrast here because if you get something wrong, you don't launch something right, you don't pay attention, you use buzzwords and then people call you out on it, um, they tend to be really high performing articles and then they stick around and they're really, really hard to flush. Trust me, I've been trying to do it for, for, for clients for quite some time. Um, 
So, needless to say, it's not the kind of reputation they hope to acquire from launch. How am I doing for time? Oh, I've got loads of time. Great. Right. Um, next one. Whoa. So this is another launch. This is Tribe Payments, um, and they launched uh, with a partner, Union Pay International, which if you guys don't know who it is, they're a big card scheme out in China, uh, and some kind of coming to Europe and have been doing some deals here. Um, Tribe would be, according to this press release, the first issuer processor to work with Union Pay in Europe. Kind of boring, maybe, but apparently that was their launch. Um, do we think this is a, a win? Are you inspired by this press release? No? Okay. Do you think so? Think it was a fail? Aha! I'm calling it a win for reasons why. Launching a new company is a major PR challenge. Just ask Sokin. Without a major funding round or headline grabbing information, um, creative thinking is required. Tribe launched with a union pay partnership. Why do they do that? What sounded like something really boring is if you know the industry, is actually something really, really interesting. This was the coverage. So ignore the press release, that's the input thing, this is the output. What it meant for Tribe to do this deal with UnionPay meant that they were the first company that can help put UnionPay cards in the hands of cardholders in Europe. If you're an FT or a Reuters journalist who have a running, what's the word, running focus on the duopoly of cards around Visa and MasterCard in Europe, any disruption to that duopoly is extremely interesting for you. So even this partnership, which meant that banks in Europe can issue uh, China Union Pay cards, um, is of interest to people like Stephen Morris, who's deputy editor at the FT. And it wasn't just those guys, uh, the Times is interested, Business Insider, etc etc and this was launched at um, uh, money 2020 in the summer which is another very large uh, fintech event and what this shows is that if you can dig under a story and sort of take it out of its kind of producty boringness and raise it into something which has got interest to the market um, you can create a really great company launch disclaimer that's a climb um, on to the next one stripe everybody's favorite irish brothers. Um, three months ahead of the... Uh, does everybody here know what SCA is? Strong customer authentication? Okay. Um, so basically, as part of PSD2, which is a new regulation that was brought in uh, across Europe, um, if you are a retailer, for example, that is accepting payments, you need now to authenticate uh, your customer using uh, two-factor authentication. This is to clamp down on, on fraud uh, and uh, effectively um, uh, people being able to uh, use cards uh, without there being a reaffirmation that the uh, card holder is, uh, has, has hold of the card. Um, the problem with um, this type of authentication is for retailers they see it as a, an obstruction to their business. Um, whereas before you could click with one pay checkout, all of a sudden now you're going to be asking people to put in PIN numbers or biometrics or to get their phone out and take a number they've been sent on their mobile phone and put it into a web page. So a lot of merchants were really worried that this would result in a, in a lot of abandoned transactions. Um, and sort of three months away from the, uh, from the SCA deadline, the market was in a bit of a frenzy. And this was this summer, by the way. Um, so Stripe put out a story uh, that forecast a potential 57 billion uh, euro dip in economic activity the first year after SCA takes effect. Do we think this was an epic win? Hands, epic win, epic win. Cool. Uh, or an epic fail? It was an epic win. Why? Because rather than do all the scaremongering and joining the Bayern crowd, um, what Stripe did was announce the first quantitative study looking at the implication of the regulation. Um, the study that they did effectively became an incredibly powerful lobbying tool with the European Commission. The European Commission um, subsequently delayed uh, the, implica uh, the implementation of SCA until March 2021. And in Stripe's first thought leadership campaign, right, so they're very big in Europe, they put out a lot of product news, etc., etc., but they haven't done a lot from an opinion and positioning perspective. We don't know what Stripe stands for as a business. Um, turns out what they stand for is they're on the side of the merchants. And they're rooting for the merchants. And they're lobbying for the merchants. That's not a bad position to be if you're selling to merchants. Um, 
What it does is demonstrate the power of quantifying an issue that everybody's talking about at the perfect time. They got the timing just right. Three months before the um, regulation go live. Um, and tapping into a really hot issue. And the best thing about it, this number gets thrown around in the media to this day. And guess what happens every time that number is mentioned? Guess who else gets mentioned? Stripe. One story will just keep on giving and giving and giving and giving for months ahead. So if you're first to market to try to provide some insight or quantify an issue, that's a really great place to be. Um, in terms of data-led stories, we had another big one this year. So Revolut, um, following the approach of Netflix and Spotify, uh, launched a new ad campaign on the tube that revealed the spending habits of its users. So one of the adverts said, uh, to the 11,867 people who bought a vegan sausage roll this month, Piers is fuming. Huh, how we laughed. Um, another read, to the 12,750 people who ordered a single takeaway on Valentine's Day, are you okay, hon? Um, what do we think for, uh, for this one? Do we think this is an epic win? Win, two or three wins here, or an epic fail? A lot more fails, and you are, you are indeed correct. Um, probably for me, the biggest fail of this year. Um, why? Well, I don't know where to start, really. Um, the blogger Iona Bain, uh, among thousands of others, tweeted that the ad was single shaming. Uh, people, ahead of, people ahead of the holiday and accused it of using patronizing language. This coverage appeared. Oh, there we go. This is Grazia. Grazia got to write about this, which tells you how far this went. Sharing customer payment data is a bit different to people's film or music tastes vis-a-vis -vis Spotify or Netflix. What about GDPR? I hear you all shouting out loud. Um, but this was only the start. So it turns out the data was actually made up. Right? So they said it was real user data. Turns out the data was made up, which is both puzzling and misleading. Um, this then prompted the Advertising Standards Agency to launch an investigation. And despite all of the ruffled feathers as a result of this, Revolut then sent a cease and desist letter to the blogger and journalist Iona, which had absolutely no legal basis, but kind of shut her up for a bit, uh, which she later found out as an, in as an individual who couldn't get the legal counsel to find out if she was in trouble. You know, it was entirely meaningless and uh, probably isn't the, the nicest way of doing business. Um, so this was the start of a crisis for Revolut, um, which included then question marks over regulatory compliance, for those of you who remember that, and also a toxic culture that became very, very public. Um, data can, great, can make a great story, but this was bad practice because using people's personal data for gain is unethical. The subjects and tone were simply outmoded in today's day and age. The story wasn't well thought out. Why say you're saying using people's data and then do a 180 and say you're not? Um, and then attacking the media for writing the story is a very fast way for them to start digging into you further. And we all know where that went. So those are, for me, um, some of the biggest epic fintech wins and fails of the year. But um, what's the biggest one? Now, I don't know if anyone's been paying attention to the Crypto Queen podcast on the BBC. Um, but I, I listened to it and I think I had a little bit of a bit of self-reflection having listened to it. Um, the biggest fail, I think, is to a large extent us, PR people, marketing communications people, the media in the fintech industry, because we've got a responsibility to get this right. Not only do we need better practice, but we need to take responsibility of working with the right organizations and the right individuals. So the crypto queen, this is Ruja Ignatova, um, part of the OneCoin uh, now SCAN, which is being um, investigated and uh, there's a trial taking place in the US at the moment, the FBI are involved. Um, they reckon 13 billion USD has been taken as part of this scam. Um, and this was enabled by us. Ruja had a platform to propagate her, frankly, lies. She was given a platform by The Economist. She had a TED talk. This is the front page of a Forbes magazine, which I believe they doctored, or I think they just got the Bulgarian edition or something like that. I don't think it's the US one. But media and marketers must take collective responsibility. We need to do our homework 
do our due diligence and make sure we work with experts, otherwise we give these sorts of people a platform. And if we don't do that soon, we won't be able to differentiate the epic wins from the epic fails. That's it. Thank you.